This is Metro Week. Our top story, the latest on the challenge to last month's Tucson City Council election. We'll detail the lawsuit that could change the city election system and speak with an election expert. Plus our journalists roundtable on the week's news. Welcome to Metro Week, I'm Andrea Kelly. In the next few days, those who were elected to the Tucson City Council will take their oath of inauguration and begin their next terms in office. They'll do so amid questions about how future city elections will work. In November, voters re-elected the four Democrats on the city ballot. The other three council members, also Democrats, are up for election in two years under the city's staggered term system. That means next week, the new council will be, well, the old council. The incumbents were re-elected according to the city's long-running election system. Under it, voting in the primary elections is restricted to residents of the ward in which a candidate is running. The primary winners face off in the general election, which is open to voters citywide. It's that election system the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals struck down as unconstitutional last month. The city council has decided to appeal. Meanwhile, two Republican candidates who lost their elections in the citywide vote filed suit. They say the circuit court's ruling makes them the winners because they had more votes than the Democrats in their respective wards. Their lawsuit is in state court, separate from the city's federal appeal. Now we'll turn to a plaintiff in that federal court case. Bruce Ash is a Republican National Committeeman who filed the federal lawsuit seeking to change Tucson's city council election system. Why did you file the lawsuit? What was the issue that you have? Well, the issue is uh, underrepresentation for Republicans in the Northeast and Eastern wards here in the city of Tucson. It's what I referred to, and, and even I think one of the judges in the Ninth, ninth District uh, referred to as the tyranny of the majority. Um, for somebody to be able to represent a ward but not have to carry that ward uh, to us seems not fair. and. Um, uh, in this past election, neither Mrs. Scott or Mr. Cunningham carried their wards, uh, as has been the case in prior elections as well. So why wait until this election year? Well, I don't know that you filed it because it's an election year, but why wait until now to file that lawsuit instead of years or decades ago? Yeah. Well, there have been other lawsuits filed along the way. Um, this one uh, was filed uh, by, a law, by a law firm that represented people who had actually run uh, as candidates in those in those wards and, and others and have uh, felt that they were uh, not uh, fairly treated. Um, and um, I had an interest in this. Uh, John Munger and I, former state party chairman, had been interested in this issue for years. Uh, and now being a, a city resident myself, I've always lived outside of the city for about the last quarter century, but now having moved into the city feeling as though I wanted to be part of the franchise, um, I entered the lawsuit as well. Now, did you specify in it that it wouldn't apply to this specific, this 2015 election cycle? I'm not sure that it was uh, a specific in that area. Um, it's a very unusual sort of a situation, a circumstance we find ourselves in where the um, decision from the ninth uh, circuit came at about the same time that the city election results were coming in. Certainly it has confused and confounded uh, some of the people as a result. Right, the timing has been, it's overlapping if nothing sure, else. Sure, sure, but, but the main thing that, that was important to us, uh, compare this let's say with Ray Carroll who uh, is a supervisor in District 4, uh, Eastern uh, Tucson, down into Green Valley and so on. Um, if, if these were under Tucson rules, Ray would be uh, elected in his primary in Ward 4 and then have to run countywide. Um, and we should just be sure to state that all of the county supervisors are elected just in their own just district. Just in their There's ward. There's no countywide. Or just in their, in their district, mm -hmm. that's correct. And, and Ray Carroll uh, represents his, his district the same way that, say, Steve Kozacek represents his district. Um, the, the whole argument that some people in the city have made that um, these are councilmen who represent the entire uh, uh, town uh, doesn't seem to fly with the facts. When uh, Grand Canyon College was supported by Regina Romero, everybody was in favor of it because Regina said that she wanted it. They deferred to her. They deferred to her. And then when she said that they 
that, that she didn't want it there. She had people in her, in her ward that didn't want Grand Canyon College. Well, all of a sudden, they all flipped the other way. Um, it's the same with Martha McSally. And in take, taking this on a statewide basis where there's a lot more Republicans than there are Democrats, um, if Martha McSally was, um, was running in, in, her, in her district, CD2, um, and let's say she was a Democrat in this case. She wins in her district in, in a primary, um, but she has to run statewide against all of these Republican voters. She might not be elected in, in her district. Same thing for Raul Grijalva. Him right. being a Democrat, if he had to run statewide, he probably wouldn't win. Um, it's, the same, it's the same sort of a concept here. It's one man, one vote. And now that I am a city resident, I felt it was important uh, that my vote be counted importantly in my own ward. And that hasn't taken place. The, the city charter, uh, this provision specifically, goes back to Jim Crow days, uh, when under the name of progressivism, uh, certain minorities uh, were left out uh, of, of representation in city councils across the country. This has largely changed all across the country. Tucson is one of the last vestiges. I'm just as much entitled to representation of the Tucson City Council being a Republican, maybe having a different view of things uh, on a citywide basis um, that affect my ward. And under the current rules, can't do that. So the city council voted to ask the Ninth Circuit for a larger hearing with right. more judges, uh, which could turn into a different result. If they, if they grant that hearing, we could see a different result or we could see the same opinion again. What are you hoping to hear? Well, obviously, I'm hoping that they'll affirm the decision that was made by the, by the three-judge uh, tribunal. Um, our attorney has indicated that if we lose in bank uh, judgment, we'll go to the Supreme Court and ask for a hearing there. Uh, I, I think that it's an important issue for, for Southern Arizona. Um, and and uh, the mayor has talked about the importance of ward-only elections. So is Jeff Rogers, who's a former uh, Democratic uh, 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 Party chairman. I think it's an important thing for Tucson. There's a 7-0 absolute supermajority, and there's very little debate that takes place at the city council level. You look at the Pima County Board of Supervisors, where they are elected district by district, there's debate, there's, there is back and forth, and there's also ownership and responsibility for the decisions that are, that are being made. And those are the things that I hope improve if we go to a ward-only election system in the city of Tucson. And just to be clear, you prefer ward-only versus citywide, which would also be uh, constitutional. I, I definitely would prefer ward-only. Bruce Ash, thanks so much for coming in. Next, we hear from the other side of that federal lawsuit. The Tucson City Council voted to ask the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for another hearing of the elections case. I interviewed Tucson Mayor Jonathan Rothschild about that decision. Let's start by having you tell us why the City Council is asking for a larger hearing from the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Well, of course, we have the decision from the Ninth Circuit. I will tell you it's a curious decision. It's an unprecedented decision, and it's one that there's a dissent that is very strong. Uh, we've had inquiries from other jurisdictions that run similar elections that want to be involved. But the real reason to appeal is that it's a election system that has been voted on by the people three times uh, and supported. And we really have a duty to our citizens to defend that system. Now, that being said, it is my belief that in 2016 we will see on the ballot uh, some alternatives for how to run our election system. The court, in its majority opinion, said the preferable system was a citywide primary, a citywide general. We know in our community there's support f for also possibly ward only. Um, if we did not appeal and let that stand to change the charter, and this is a charter change, you have to get 50 percent of the people to vote for one system or the other. And so this appeal will frame, if we're successful, what that charter question might look like. If it is successful, then we could put one thing on the ballot. If it gets more than 50 percent, it's the new system. If it doesn't, the old system stays in place. If it is unsuccessful, we're going to have to frame a question that creates a system so that 
we have a legal system going into 2017. So voters might be choosing then between just ward only or just citywide, potentially. Uh, that I think is a real likelihood. Yeah. Now, you're a lawyer and you've just said that the, the citizens of the city or the residents of the city have voted three times to keep this election system, but ultimately even if voters have approved this, if it's unconstitutional, it can't stand. Yeah, no, that would be true. Uh, it's been a system that's been in place since 1929. Um, and when you read the two opinions carefully, the majority opinion did not address the legal analysis for where you would upset a system. The dissent did. And the real question is, and it is a, a question of significance, is is a political party a protected class? Uh, the majority opinion did not address that and simply went on to say this is an awfully odd system and we don't think it's the most efficient system. We think the most efficient system is citywide primary, citywide general. That may be true from a political point of view, but not necessarily a legal point of view. But again, I think that there's been enough conversation in our community. Remember, we had the Charter Commission before that split equally on that. And I believe our council is going to refer to the voters options now uh, to make a decision as to how they want to govern. And that's probably for the best. Now, I just want to follow up on another thing you mentioned, which is that other cities are kind of interested watching how this is going to go. Those must be from out of state because Tucson is the only one in Arizona with this system. Correct. They are out of state. Um, 81 out of 91 cities in our state run citywide primary, citywide general. But our voters should have the choice as to how they want to uh, vote. Now let's look to your next term in office, which starts on Monday. And we've, we've always heard that there's been lots of budget issues the last several years. It's something we've talked about a lot in interviews. So um, on the budget front, what's, what's coming right when you take your next term? Well, um, I, I'd like to start a little bit, because it does go to the next four years, is what we tried to accomplish in the last four years. And what we tried to accomplish was to restore trust and confidence in city government. And I think we did that by resolving the Rio Nuevo dispute and seeing the blossoming of downtown. I think we did that with our road bond issue, which we're seeing the improvement over the roads and we're seeing the roads being done on time, uh, below budget and on the schedule that the voters approved. And I think we've done that in the general sense of how we have worked with uh, uh, other jurisdictions uh, in, in Phoenix and around the state and uh, even into Mexico and in, in, in showing that Tucson can be a responsible leader uh, with our region. Um, Andrea, you're correct that our next significant challenge is going to be with how do we assure that we can continue to provide uh, the basic services that we are providing and even enhance those services going into the future. Um, through no fault of anyone's, uh, uh, we are looking at a ballooning of our public safety pension costs and those costs have to be honored. Those were promises made to uh, first responders who worked 20, 30 years. Uh, but at the same time, the way those costs are going to escalate are going to mean that if we want to continue with the services, keep our city strong, our police, our fire, our transit, our roads, our parks, uh, we're going to have to find revenue sources. And we're likely uh, going to be required to go to the voters and convince them that that's the right thing to do. You're talking about a tax increase. Uh, we could be looking at sales tax. We could be looking at uh, raising the cap on the property tax. Uh, we will probably be looking at some um, restructuring of how we do business in the city. Uh, all those things are going to be on the table. Thanks for joining us. For another perspective, I asked Joe Canefield to weigh in. He's an election law expert, the lawyer for the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. He also previously was the state's election director, enforcing state election laws. 
The city of Tucson has had this election system for decades. Why does there have to be a legal challenge to get to this unconstitutional ruling? Well, the challenge was brought by uh, several voters, uh, Republican voters, who argue that because of the way that the primary election is run in relation to the general election, that their, the strength of their vote is effectively diluted because they can vote to nominate a Republican in their ward, but then the election is citywide, and they believe that their vote is is effectively diluted because Democrats, there's more Democrats in the city than there are Republicans. Why is there no scrutiny of that system until there's a lawsuit? Well, the system, you know, is, as any election law, is presumed to be constitutional, um, and since no one has ever challenged this law that, that I'm aware of, uh, you know, they're, 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 the law was presumed to be effective until now. Like all other laws? Like all other laws. Okay. Um, can you explain the justice's uh, logic in the opinion that ward-only primaries and citywide general elections is unconstitutional? So the, it's a two-to-one decision. It's the Ninth Circuit. So the Ninth Circuit sits in three judge panels. In this case, the uh, majority decision was authored by Judge Kaczynski. Uh, he and his colleague, uh, the logic was that the, um, uh, that the under the one person one vote principle, which has been in existence for several decades now, where it means that everybody is entitled to have their vote counted and weighted equally and effectively, uh, is compromised here because the hybrid election system where, where the ward based voters nominate uh, their candidates in, pri in partisan primaries, so Republicans nominate Republican from each ward, Democrats nominate a Democrat, but then in the citywide vote, it's all voters decide who the representative is going to be from each ward. So the Republican challengers feel, and the majority in the court agreed, that their votes were effectively diluted because they were they were being uh, compromised as a result of the citywide uh, election or the, the fact that the vote voters citywide were going to be choosing who the ward representative would be. So now this goes to, or, or the city is asking for a full hearing of the, I'm sorry, is it 29 or 27? I think there's 28 active judges on the Ninth Circuit now. It might, might, it might be off by one number there, but that's that's what you do. You, you're, you ask for, it's called en banc reconsideration. So you're asking for the whole court to review this panel's decision. Um, the way the process works is the whole court will then decide whether to rehear the case. Uh, they'll have a vote. It's probably done via email. Um, and if a majority of the court, of the judges on the court, agree that it should be heard, well, then a, another 11 judge panel will be uh, determined at random. The presiding judge and 10 additional judges on the Ninth Circuit may or may not consist of the three judges on the initial panel. Um, and those 11 judges will then rehear the case and decide whether the panel got it correct. And does that involve new oral arguments by each side? It, it could, yeah. And the Ninth Circuit has a courtroom where 11 judges can sit and look down on you as counsel and, and uh, pepper you with questions. And, and that's often how it's done, especially in a case like this involving a constitutional issue. Now, the court you know, doesn't have to hear it. These, these cases are rare rarely granted. Um, usually you have to show that there's some uh, conflict among an, with another panel on the Ninth Circuit or that the U.S. Supreme Court um, has, a, has ruled differently on the issue. Um, and then if it is heard, then the pa panel, will, like I said, will likely have oral argument and then issue its own separate opinion. Now, if it's not heard, then the decision that we have now stands. And what are the city's options? So they, they, well, they, there's still the option to appeal the case to the United States Supreme Court, and that can come now um, or at, after an en banc panel determines the case, um, or if, if the panel denies, if en banc reconsideration is denied, then there can be a direct appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, that is discretionary by the court. So if the court denies the, the cert in that case, then we call it certiorari, um, then the case will be final, will go back to the district court, and then there'll have to be a remedy. There's another case in Pima County Superior Court, two Republicans who lost the citywide election a few weeks ago, but would have won if it was ward only races in the general election, are suing to effectively win those seats or another election cycle. 
Um, will that case depend on the outcome of this request for an en banc hearing or even a potential Supreme Court appeal? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, the case isn't final at this point. So the judge below is going to need to know whether the Ninth Circuit decision is going to stand or be overturned either by uh, an en banc panel of the court or by the U.S. Supreme Court itself. Um, so at this point, it seems unlikely that the election results themselves are going to be overturned. Of course, I, I understand that the, the challengers in the case are asking for that specific relief, and that's being considered by the judge who, who could decide differently, but that seems unlikely. The Tucson City election system is unique. Are, is this kind of a lawsuit in the, this federal case unique? Uh, this, this is a, 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 un, I've never seen a system like this. Um, in the decision itself, the court does cite to uh, a ruling from another court where in another state where judicial elections were determined in a similar way where they were, um, there, was a part, there was a primary held in districts like or wards in the case of the city of Tucson. Uh, but then the judges were ultimately selected by the jurisdiction as a whole in the general election. Uh, so that's as close as, as it seems to be, at least with respect to what the, the, the a court found in this case. And I presume that, that all the case law was canvassed um, when making these arguments. So this is a unique system. Joe Canfield, thanks for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lorraine Rivera. Tonight on Arizona Week, the 25th anniversary of the Arizona Desert Wilderness Act. Places where the human spirit uh, can get uh, regenerated, uh, that will be there forever. Um, what a gift. Now our journalist roundtable. Joining me today are Dylan Smith of the Tucson Sentinel and Christopher Conover, my colleague here at Arizona Public Media. Thanks to both of you for stopping by. So Dylan, we've talked a lot about that Ninth Circuit decision, but I just wanted to follow up with one question for you, which is when will we know whether the Ninth Circuit has taken this extra hearing? Not anytime soon, probably. I mean, we, we might know that it gets on the schedule, but that hearing probably will not happen for months if it, if it does uh, get, get taken up. So we might not see you know, anything going on there until maybe March. There's no rush for the court. They ruled after the election. So there's no rush for them to rule now or hold another hearing. So they'll take their time with it. That leads right on into the other lawsuit that's pending in um, state court in Pima County Superior Court. Dylan, can you explain what that secondary lawsuit is about? There's a, a local lawsuit that the uh, two of the re three Republican candidates who lost have filed seeking to basically overturn the election. They either want to be declared the winners because they won their wards on the east side, even though they lost overall in a landslide, or to have the judge say, we need to hold a new election. And so there, that, a decision in that is expected uh, either uh, today, Friday, or Monday that the uh, hearing was held uh, this week. And that's sort of, it's really prompted by this Ninth Circuit opinion. They're saying since the Ninth Circuit ruled, we should we should reconsider Tucson elections in retrospect or in the rearview mirror, the yes. one that just ended. Yeah. Um, so we're expecting that ruling today. How will that case, how, how will the federal case affect this local case? Well, what the local case, what, the, what, these, uh, what Kelly Lawton and uh, Margaret Burkholder are asking, that they say that they base their case on that Ninth Circuit decision that uh, says that Tucson's elections are unconstitutional. But what the decision says is not what they're asking for. The decision says that we need to have either, you know, all by ward elections or citywide elections and says that our system was unconstitutional. Basically, everybody who's been running for years has been running unconstitutionally if you accept that decision is true. So you can't just say, well, I'm the winner of the election. Everybody was doing it wrong. And to make those changes, it will be up to everybody who lives in the city because that's a charter change which has to go on the ballot. So the city, if depending on where we stand in court cases, and these court cases could drag on for a very long time. It could go all the way to the Supreme Court in theory. Uh, the city will eventually have to do a citywide election to change the charter in order to change the election system. The, the, the basis of the decision, as it affects the, the local case, the, the three-judge panel says that because 
Tucson City Council members represent the entire city. That's what the charter says. Really, the tenor of the decision is towards in, in favor of citywide elections, not in favor of ward-only elections, as the, uh, the, the two Republicans are, are trying to press their case locally. But the decision also, it seemed to lean toward citywide elections for both the primary and the general, but it did say that ward-only for everything or citywide for everything, both yeah. of those would be constitutional. It, it, those would be options, yes. Right. Right. I want to switch to another topic. We don't have very much time today. Um, Christopher, this week, Governor Doug, actually, last week, Governor Doug Ducey called for a border strike force, but we heard some pushback this week. First, tell us what that force is. The force is it will come under DPS, uh, the Department of Public Safety, and it's a group that's supposed to go right after drugs and human smuggling, a lot on drugs. He unveiled it at a U.S. Senate uh, committee field hearing on heroin. Um, and he was touting a lot of arrests by this task force that he'd spun up about two months ago. We've now started hearing pushback from border sheriffs, uh, some of whom are saying, what task force? There's only a major assigned to it. We've not heard about this task force. Uh, and DPS has confirmed that, that yes, there is a major assigned to it, but that's the only staff. And the sheriffs also say the state has taken money from the counties for years and shifted costs to the counties. Why don't you just give us that money back instead of the tens of millions of dollars you want to spend on this task force and we'll take care of it for you because th these are our jurisdictions. We know them. Pima County Sheriff uh, Chris Nanos is essentially saying you took $22 million from Pima County this year, the state budget did, and now you want to give us some extra officers. And he's it's calling that an imbalance, right? Well, and DPS is already uh, rather underfunded. They've got about a hundred vacant positions. There are entire shifts in the middle of the night where there are no DPS officers patrolling our highways right now. That's what one of the border sheriffs was saying. Uh, I believe it was Sheriff Estrada said, after midnight, 2 a.m., there are no DPS officers in his county. So if you're worried about when people are illegally crossing the border, well, everybody knows that. When do you think they're illegally crossing the border? Why don't you just go ahead and fully staff either DPS or go ahead and give us the money to hire people because we know our counties best. We're also hearing from Cochise County Sheriff Mark Daniels that he supports the plan. Why is he countering these other border sheriffs? He picked up some extra dollars uh, earlier this year from uh, the governor when there was a lot of complaining from sheriffs uh, that they were losing money. The governor started pushing money back down to the local level and he was the first one who got dollars. So I think that may have a lot to do with it. I want to flip to a, actually a federal issue, but we've been hearing local reaction this week. Uh, the Pentagon announced that it's going to allow women in combat roles in the military. Um, first of all, how expansive was that policy change, Christopher? It affects about 10% of the jobs available in the military, but it means that women are now eligible to go into some of the more elite uh, combat things, such as Navy SEALs. Uh, we've seen women going into the Rangers. We had three graduate this year, but it opens up all the positions. Marine recon. The Marines did a study, women versus men, that came out that said women were not as effective at those combat jobs. That study has taken a lot of heat um, and now basically has been thrown by the wayside and said, nope, you're opening up everything to women. The Marines have said, absolutely, but they have to meet our standards. We'll see how it gets uh, balanced out in the end. The Defense Secretary said there will be no exceptions to the policy, and uh, was rather welcomed by uh, Congresswoman Martha McSally. So he said it was say? about damn time that this happened. And that's a direct quote, right? Yes. That is a, direct, a written direct quote. Uh, another quote uh, that came out of Congress was uh, Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth, a Democrat who's a Gulf War vet. She lost both of her legs in a helicopter crash. She was a helicopter pilot, and her quote was, I didn't lose these legs in a bar fight. And in our last minute, I also want to touch on uh, John McCain, our senator, who is also chairman of the Armed Services Committee. What's his response to this? A, a little bit more cautious. He says that Congress needs to review this in the 30 days it, it will take bef before it comes into effect. A couple of years ago, he was a, a little bit more of a cheerleader for this move. But at this point, he's uh, you know, sounding a, a bit more of a cautious note. And have we heard from anybody else in our Arizona delegation? Those are the big ones we've heard from at this point. Uh, Kirsten Sinema was pleased with it, but McSally had the quote of the day.
And we haven't seen, I mean, and that's a, kind of a split within the Republican Party for Arizona right there. So we'll see if there's any changes on that Armed Services Committee, any recommended, recommended changes. Thank you both for coming in this week. I appreciate your time. Next week, we'll look at the region's economic outlook for 2016. As always, you can catch up on news or comment on our work at our website. Thanks for watching.